All right, welcome back. Um, this is Mike Mason. I have computer issues, and he's on the spot to change it. So, Mike. You can take that away if you want. Wave hi to everyone. That's your television debut. I like his haircut. I think he's got a great haircut, in my opinion. It's really, he's, yeah. he's uh, debonair. I'll use this time, by the way, to say happy birthday to my dad since we had a little interlude there. Uh, <laughs> my dad doesn't really like sports all that much, certainly not the way I do, and he doesn't talk as much as I do, but if I ever say something clever, it's generally his doing. So happy birthday, smart dad. man, yes. Well, happy birthday to Mr. Muller, and Mr. Mason over here is going to take care of that, and uh, if you had... Thought of getting some tweets in. I'm not getting them right now. That's why we're trying to figure that out. 412-928-9370. J.J. Watt, everyone's favorite topic. Um, so, uh, to me, it doesn't make sense here unless it's a huge pay reduction that he would have to accept. Because I think playing with your brothers, even though that's kind of a cool thing, it, it won't be what J.J. Watt ultimately wants. And I don't know how far away the, the Steelers are. I still think the Steelers can be a competitive team. I don't know if they would be in a discussion right now in any way with a contending Super Bowl team. Where does he want to go? What will it take, Chris? And, and do you think it could end up here? I don't think it probably will end up here. I, you know, it always could, right? If he was willing to take something ridiculous like veteran minimum and then they cut to it and rolled the dice that Watt would stay healthy, like that frees up room for them, obviously, and then you just assume he'll manage to be a fit. But, I mean, this isn't even to denigrate the Steelers here. You could go to Green Bay, which is near where you grew up, which was a team that just needed maybe a little bit more oomph in every way to get to the Super Bowl. You also have a quarterback who, while he's old, is coming off an MVP season. That's clearly a better destination than the Steelers. There was something interesting to me in the, in the Watt to the Steelers rumors and this idea, because it makes obvious sense, and of course it's going to get headlines because his brothers both play here. But most of what I saw was like, hey, you know, we'll change our name to Watt Brothers Sandwich Shop or something like that. And it felt way more like fan service and like something that could be easily marketed than it did something, A, realistic, and B, that something that would put the Steelers over the top. It just, it seems like a cool story to mention, but that he's gonna probably end up somewhere else. And if he wants a title, he should. Yeah, and hey, listen, he's not what he once was, but he still had 14 and a half tackles for losses last year, five sacks. He can help a team, there's no question, especially one that's close. Let's go to the Lions at 412-575-2600. Thank you, DJ Mikey. Mikey got my computer working again. Frank and Moon <laughs> is up first. Hey, Frank, how you doing? Bob, how are you? Hi, Chris, how are you tonight? Good. Um, yeah, you know what, guys? I watch a ton of hockey. I mean, I've watched it for years, and I watch games every day. And uh, if you remember the St. Louis Blues when they won the Cup, they had like a fourth, a great fourth line. Tampa Bay last year had a great fourth line. That's my biggest problem with the Penguins. I know the goaltending suspect, but I'm gonna tell you what: that fourth line we have is terrible. And if they don't do something to improve that fourth line, which I think maybe Burke and Hextall might be working on. I don't think they have a shot. It's, fun, it's funny you mentioned those two Stanley Cup winning teams back to back as Patrick Maroon was on both of them and I think occupied a spot on those lines. And, and he's a big guy, which also makes you wonder about the Penguins. And Brian Burks, he loves the heavy hitters. He loves big, heavy hockey teams. That's not what they have here. But, hey, Chris, uh, you know, the bottom line is the Jankowski line, I think he's right, had, had a good start the first game, I think. And ever since then, they haven't been very good. Well, I think the key with any fourth line, really anything outside of your top two, which should always be scoring lines, the Penguins had this with that third line, the HBK line or the Cook Kennedy stall line in 09. I mean, we know this very well here. When you get down to the third line and then especially the fourth line, I think the important thing is that that line has to have a really defined identity. What do they do? What are they, when they're out there on the ice, what are they supposed to be doing? Like the Clutterbuck line, I believe, is still nominally the fourth line for the Islanders yeah. in, a lot, in, in most games. Sezikis is on that line. Like, Matt I look Martin. at them, and I know, ex I, yeah, I know exactly what they're out there to do. Occasionally, they might hurt that team. Like, Matt Martin woke up Malkin or whatever, poked the bear a little bit, and they <laughs> paid for it. But you know what those three are out there to do. They're out to mess people up. They're out to make some plays, and they're, about to, they're out there to kind of get energy going and occasionally score goals. Uh, I'm, I'm not, like, of the belief that a line that plays maybe seven or eight minutes a game is hugely determinative. I think it's kind of a – a hockey cliche to say you got to have a good fourth line, but in a lot of ways, you at least have to have one that gives your team an identity for the short period of time that they're out on the ice. Mike Sullivan really, really wanted that uh, Tanev line with uh, Bluger out there and Zach Aston Reese on the ice a lot. He put them up against Washington's best uh, unit yesterday, and it diminished the, the number of minutes of Genny Malkin had, and that's just a, a coach's choice to play a line that's hot, and he rolled them out there, and I thought it was a good decision. By the way, we have some... Uh, 
feedback on Twitter, you can hit us up at KD Pomp, at Chris Muller PGH. I had posted a, a Chris Letang soundbite tonight. I thought it was interesting how he talked about Sidney Crosby, not just a leader, not just the face of a team or a league, but Chris Letang says he's much more as a teammate. He went into great detail. So Frank Sendrich on Twitter says, talking about Captain 87, the bad actors, shows off on Instagram, TikTok, get all the headlines, but 87 isn't looking for headlines. He just goes about his business, and he's done it all his career. Back to the lines. we got John and Franklin. What's up, John? How are you? Hey, fellas. How you doing? I just have a, a baseball question for you. Mm -hmm. Sure. It's baseball uh, season, right? Is this the week? Pitchers and catchers. Well, yeah, it's getting started. Hey, uh, how about a uh, starting lineup for the Pirates? What are, you, what are you guys are figuring on? Oh, boy. Well, Colin Moran will be out oh, of third. God. He'll be at first. It'll be Hayes. At, uh, Cole Tucker, if they trade Fraser, it'll probably be Newman, right, Chris? Where am I going? You got Stallings behind home plate. And the Stallings behind the, the plate. Reynolds. Reynolds Goodwin. Uh, why am I? Godwin. What's, who, who do they just acquire? Brian, uh, I forget his uh, name. Goodwin, I, I this think. This shows you and how Polanco. disconnected I am. Polanco, Polanco will be out there. Yeah. This shows you how disconnected I am from them. I just read a USA Today post uh, about predicting records. It had the Pirates at 57 and 105. There were 300 lost teams projected, the Orioles, the Tigers, and the Pirates. And then they had the audacity in USA Today to say it might be worse than it actually looks for the Pirates. I know they're supposed to be bad. And so if you are like me and you are saying, Kumar Rocker, whoever's going to be the number one pick, that's, that's the goal here. Okay, you sort of want to hear that. That's like hearing your team's going to be in first place uh, if they're supposed to try to win a title. But... Here, seeing 57 and 105 and then the person who writes it going, yeah, it actually might be worse than that, that makes it tough on some fundamental level to get really fired up, as Richie would say, to get bucko fever. Oh, yeah, well, it's hard to get that. I will say, since you brought up Kumar Rocker, you know, interestingly, because if he's the number one pick, which he will be for them, and that's good, the question I would have is, how do they time this right? Because that guy apparently is ready to pitch in the majors right now, or at least he's very close. But in the pirate way of thinking, they don't want to necessarily do that so that they save you so that guys, other guys in the organization can kind of be up here at the same time. That could be a big mistake. Do you think that's all they'll handle it? What will they do with him? Uh, what will they do? I mean, they're going to do what every, just about every team does. I mean, I would even include the big markets, and they're going to manipulate the service time to make sure he's not a super two guy, and they're going to say he's got to work on X, Y, and Z, and maybe he will. I mean, I think sometimes there's some validity to that. But if he's ready to pitch in the major leagues, he needs to pitch in the major leagues, period. That's I mean, what I say. If that means your window with him is, is one year or maybe two years where the rest of your team has caught up and that's all you've got him for, so be it. Like, what you just said there – and what is endemic to every team basically in baseball is the problem with the sport. We're sitting here talking about a guy we would all love to see be a generational pitcher if the Pirates draft him. And you very, very accurately have to worry about, ooh, can they time it out right so that he's with the rest of this core if it all comes together. It's just really, right. it's disheartening on a pretty fundamental level. Yeah, that's why it is what it is. It's a, it's a, it's a league that needs change, and I don't think we're ever going to see it. By the way, we have an NBA question coming up since you and I both like it. I'll get to that on our Twitter. That's next. But right now it's time for our Sportsnet stat. Tri-State Office Furniture tweet of the day. And this comes to us from Sportsnet. They say Austin Matthews is the first Leafs player with 13 goals in his first 15 games since Wendell Clark back in 93-94. And Austin Matthews had a couple tonight. That guy 13-15, and 15, although they blew a 5-1 lead to the lowly Ottawa Senators. And Ottawa won that game in overtime 6-5. to five. We'll have some NBA talk. Believe it or not, it's coming up next right here on the Ireland Contracting Nightly Sports Call.